the entrepreneurship, the drive, the innovation, the desire to do something different, beating the hidden, uh, beating the uh, trodden path, so and so forth. Now, if that gets scaled up, scaling will be successful. If that gets lost out, we might have found that sandboxes. But if that soul, the spirit, Hindi image is called pran kehte, if that's not there, then one, one might have 500 sandboxes, but without the soul. My sense is that when one is trying to scale up from a pilot to a large project, let me talk about agriculture, the dairy cooperative. Two important principles. A farmer gets fair price on the basis of quality. If I pour milk which has 7% fat, I will be rewarded better. And if I do mixing, if I do Hera Ferry, if I add water, then I am not going to get fair price. That is the design principle of a, a good, well-run cooperative. That far, a farmer gets remunerated on the basis of quality at the right time, not one, one year after, in every 15 days. That is the design core element of a good-run cooperative. A second, a farmer gets linked to the market and therefore the risk of the market are taken care by the cooperative. Now, if these two elements get replicated in a scaled up operation, chances are that that scaling up operation will be true to uh, the kind of innovation, the kind of initial activity started. So, in my, uh, in my thinking, the kind of, and that's what I gave three different examples, one might have to look very carefully at the design of the innovation, the pilot, the activity that has happened, and is that getting replicated, is that core, the soul, the pran, the fundamental principles in the process of moving to different locations, reaching larger numbers, reaching, uh, adding different dimensions, I think the key principle I would think is that, and then it comes to agriculture, agriculture then there is food crop, there is cash crop, there is dry land, there is irrigated land, there is a different kind of a challenge in a North Indian state, there is a different kind of challenge in a South Indian state. In spite of all the diversity, if one is able to understand, respond with that core intervention, which is the basis of the, why, why should somebody come to me? That's the intervention. And then if one is able to capture that and replicate it, that's one, that's the point that I want to highlight. And the second point is, and to do that, one also has to think in terms of the ecosystem, which has been talked about here for large, every year, one year's ecosystem. Because the intervention is not happening in isolation. For an intervention in agriculture, the intervention is surrounded by an ecosystem which com comprises of market, traders, APMC, input suppliers, large corporates, small corporates, large farmers, small farmers, government policies, NREGS and all that. Now, how does my intervention fit into that larger ecosystem? And as I scale up, what are the challenges that intervention will, my intervention in terms of its interaction with the larger ecosystem, how that is going to challenge me? It's not going to accept all that I do. It's going to be a dynamic process. And to the extent I'm able to negotiate that, that scaling up probably will be a little bit easier. I know it's a little bit abstract, a little bit, uh, one, may, one, one might have to talk about it with concrete examples, but my sense is, if one is able to replicate the design soul, the core, and one is able to manage successfully with the ecosystem that one is in part of, or, uh, or as a member of, then probably intervention processes, and the various uh, framework that Vanita has pointed out. So in a way, that framework is essentially the design framework or the ecosystem. If you've got standard operating procedures and you've prototyped it well, how isn't that sort of half the battle won in scaling, which then doesn't require you to have very high quality or human resources or souls all the time? You know, you could do this with people who you build local resource persons. You could do this with those who are not so very highly skilled. So, what would you say to that? Thanks, Marita. I'll give again an unrelated example, uh, partly also because I never worked as a farmer. So, that's the excuse. I'll give one example. Banking correspondent ki baat ho rahi hai. Financial inclusion, banking correspondent. 
so that people, each and every person has access to financial services. Now, that banking for correspondent model is fundamentally weak, in my opinion. And it will never scale up in the next 10 years. Why it is fundamentally weak? Because if I decide to work as a banking correspondent in a village, servicing about 200 farmers, customers, helping them to open up bank accounts, help them link with the credit, I need to be compensated for that service. And if my current level of compensation is 2,500 rupees only, 2,500 rupees only, this banking correspondent model is not going to scale up. Why? Somebody in the Reserve Bank of India thought that 2,500 rupees for a village banking correspondent is a big money. Sorry, boss. In a village, aspirations are going up. If I need to stay in a village and survive myself with dignity, I need minimum 8, 10, 12, 15,000 rupees. Okay, I don't need 40,000 rupees. Agreed. You need 40,000 rupees in, to stay in Bangalore or Hubli. But if I need to stay well, comfortably in a village, I need to be compensated in the range of 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. That's my assumption. I've traveled all over the country like all of you would have. And if a banking correspondent gives me only 2,500 rupees, I will never become a banking correspondent. Now to come back and relate this example to Vanita's example, the prototype is faulty. The prototype itself is faulty because the prototype assumes that people will work at a cheap remuneration and they'll be happy to have 2,500 and they will work for the bank in terms of the larger goal of financial inclusion. No. I'll work for the larger goal of financial inclusion if my basic remunerative needs are taken care of and then I'll work for the larger financial inclusion. Therefore, the prototype has to again, and therefore I go back to the soul again. The soul is faulty. The basic design principle is faulty. It has no potential. So even if I can go on refining the prototype and I need to have 10,000 people, the quality question doesn't come in because the basic model itself is not faulty. And therefore, I think coming back to your question, the quality issue will probably be taken care of if some of the fundamental principles are to a large extent tackled, to a large extent tackled. One, one is not saying that one should wait for 100% perfect prototype. But if the prototype is perfect to the extent of 70, 80, 90%, then chances are that in spite of large diversity, in spite of differences in capacities of human resources that one is able to attract, successful pilots will actually be scaled up. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Ajit uh, what he said that in the beginning, like uh, in the beginning in agriculture, especially in the agriculture, maybe it may be different in uh, health and education, but in agriculture, in the beginning we need a demos or trials in a small scale. These demos and trials uh, may be success or may, may not be success, but again we have to try and try out. Uh, in a over a period of time, like uh, three years or four years, then uh, we can scale it up up to uh, like uh, the innovations in the agriculture. It will not happen in a was it in a overnight. It takes a it, it takes it own time, and also it depends on the need and also individuals and also institutions and also organizations. Then uh, the individuals like uh, Srijan me. Srijan or Manuvikas or maybe Deshpande Foundation, like that, we can reach up to a certain point of time, like 1,000, 3,000 or 10,000. And also, for scaling up, the same module or same technology, the prototyping of the same module in other agroclimatic zones, like what we are doing here is SRI method of paddy cultivation in Uttar Kannada and Haveri district. Like uh, we prototype the, uh, was that, uh, we tried the same technology in, uh, was that, uh, in Chhattisgarh, Korea district. But uh, the same prototype we can't replicate there with the same principles. It needs a lot of changes, 50% changes. Because their agroclimatic changes, their people mindset, their soils, uh, uh, was that, uh, type of soils, and also their mindset uh, towards agriculture is uh, entirely different. And also their resources is uh, entirely different. We can't prototype or we can't implement the same model in other agroclimatic zones. That's my experience. Uh, and uh, again, uh, to scale it up, we need a was it a, a concrete prototype or concrete models uh, for different uh, agroclimatic zones and also for different people. The who is a, the farmer having a half an acre land. They, uh, 
you may was that uh, you know uh, adopt sri technology easily but it uh, but who is having a three acres of land he may not uh, was that adopt sri technology e easily because of the resource and also the is affordability and also is uh, was that income level and is risk taking ability all are different and also we can't uh, was that uh, um, was that, uh, develop the same type of sri was that technologies for half an acre one acre and also for three acres is is uh, again uh, we can say that uh, five principles you have to adopt but the all the farmers could not adopt in the same uh, village uh, like uh, from last five years we are working on uh, sri method of uh, technology promotion of sri method uh, of uh, technology uh, at this point of time i am feeling that any technology in the agriculture or livelihood to if you want to scale it up we need a other stakeholders in the platform like uh, government maybe other agencies like that and also we need a favorable policies to scale it up you may say that you have to adopt this technology that technology and all at the end of the was that uh, uh, day we need a certain kind of policies at the topper level to adopt the technologies or to scale it up the technologies like uh, maybe in health maybe in education or in agriculture like that we need a policies at the end and also what uh, our experience is uh, right now we are in this stage two we did a hard uh, was that experimentation and trial in a small scale and all this thing and also we created a community institutions and also to scale it up we need a convergence with other programs and also we have to identify the local resource person who can take it after was that uh, we came out after our exit we have to train the local resource person who can uh, was that to teach every day to that uh, uh, illiterate farmers to uh, to monitoring or maybe he has to go go to field and address the was that the problems uh, then and there only like that we have to create a knowledge of our resource persons at the village level and also we have to sell our uh, model to uh, was that uh, our technology to bigger like uh, government uh, players or maybe uh, government uh, other thing and we have to implement the policy levels to make a favorable policies to scale it uh, uh, scale of the technology uh, well friends uh, i'll not take much time but i would like to highlight key aspects of the scalable approaches which biop have been uh, able to work with and uh, uh, take it to the larger scale uh, across country uh, in biop uh, our target uh, population is uh, the rural communities particularly the poorest among poor and uh, the tribals as well uh, the coverage uh, in 1967 we started uh, through the inspiration of uh, gandhian dr manibhai desai we started with few families in orli uh, kanchan near pune and now we are up to uh, say 90000 villages and uh, every year we cover about uh, 4.5 million families across these uh, 90000 villages our core programs include uh, the livestock breed improvement uh, which includes the large ruminants and small ruminant uh, through our 4000 cattle development centers across uh, 90000 villages uh, natural resource management program includes uh, the specific model or approach development in ravines in sodic lands in silvi pasture commons in uh, Uh, states like uh, rajasthan and then environmental restoration particularly for the tribal communities we have been able to develop uh, devise the wadi approach which basically uh, empowers the tribal communities to develop their own asset which is otherwise uh, underused or underutilized one acre of land to transform into a productive asset which which is them substantial uh, livelihood opportunities and then there are cross cutting issues like forming people's institutions primarily to take on the program and also uh, include women in the program this whole effort is being backed up uh, through the research center which is there in urli kanchan and there are some satellite research centers across uh, seven eight states Uh, so this entire program is backed up uh, through these research centers and uh, demonstration piloting incubating centers i can say well let me talk uh, a little bit about wadi 
Well, Wadi is primarily developed for uh, the poorest of poor. Underemployment has been a challenge for almost 40% uh, of Indian population and it is more challenging in the tribal belt of central India which uh, covers Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, part of Andhra Pradesh, part of uh, little bit of Karnataka, Maharashtra, Northern and Western Maharashtra and many other areas in the uh, Northern side like Bihar and uh, Jharkhand and those areas. So it's a major issue of addressing the underemployment. What does it mean is the population depend on agriculture which helps them for their livelihood only for four to six months. For remaining period they have to go to the cities, nearby cities or far away cities for employment which basically fill their stomach and the stomach of their families. So this was the great challenge uh, 30 years back uh, where uh, we started working uh, with these tribal families. We started working with the very simple approach, very simple intervention which tribal are already aware of, which tribal love, which tribal have affection to. It's basically plantation of a tree, it's basically nurturing a plant in their own family, in their own farm which makes them happy seeing the growth of that particular plant. We started in early 80s in South Gujarat equipping the tribal family to develop their one acre farm into an orchard which they knew it. They, since they are forest dwellers, they know how to nurture the plant. So this is how the program was conceived and this is how the prototype was developed. The design was created. The whole technology was demystified right from grafting, planting, nurturing and harvesting was grasped by the tribal people. And then the product which was taken out of this orchard was also taken to the market with value addition. Meanwhile, the entire process was adopted by the tribal, they formed the groups, they formed the cooperatives and the role which BIOP had played in the initial five to six year period was taken over gradually by the tribal people. If I can put in the financial terms, the establishment cost for this uh, orchard was about 40,000 rupees on an average. It ranges from say 5,000 rupees in the areas like Haveri and Darwad and in the remotest tribal areas it goes up to 40,000 rupees and in places like Badmer it goes much beyond that because no water, the sandy soil, there is no pran in soil, there is no jivan water availability in such an area and farmers they pitch on an average about 35,000 to 40,000 rupees per annum through this orchard. The whole process, the transformation also empowers people. They get converted into the organizations, people's organizations and the amount of transactions they make, we have cooperatives with the business of rupees 6 crores or 60 millions, is it right? So they, they uh, actually provide support to the farmers. They actually get into the product procurement, aggregation and marketing. So this is one scalable approach which BIOP has developed. We started with 80, 80 families in South Gujarat, 82 families to be precise, in early 80s. And now the program scale is uh, the project which projects which BIOP directly implements, we are covering 2 lakh families, 200,000 families across uh, 7 states. NABAD took this approach for scaling up. They put a fund, uh, tribal development fund, which was to the tune of 1,000 plus crores uh, since last 8-10 uh, years. Now they have scaled up and the amount of fund is much larger. The government of India, tribal ministry, they identified BIOP as uh, the center of excellence to take this program at much larger scale 
And now each state government uh, uh, with the directions of central ministry, they are also taking up these programs through their TSP or other funding sources. So this is one uh, scalable approach which we could develop and the entire funding so far has been uh, through the government sources. I'm going to get critical about the development sector in general. And this has been my experience. One big problem with the sector is that we never like to criticize ourselves, okay? We, we'll always project the successes very beautifully, but we actually don't want to share what went wrong. Because that means having to admit that you did it wrong, okay? And I have myself, as an organization, I have, we have struggled to get information on what did you do wrong so that we, cannot, we don't have to waste that one extra year that we do trying to figure out and learning it from ourselves. So there's one problem I would say is an inherent problem with the sector itself. That is, you know, maybe they're afraid they won't get funds if they make a mistake or so on. We are not allowed to make mistakes. Have you noticed? You know, it, I think it's probably a DNA of, this, of Indians in general. None of us. The government will never forgive you. You are not allowed to say to government that, gosh, you know what? I made a mistake. That's your money, but we failed. Maybe donors are much better at it. I mean, I can go to the Ford Foundation very easily and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Nobody's going to, going to go after us. Because they'll say, can you tell us what went wrong and so that you can do it right the next time. Government doesn't allow you that. So part of it is the fact that you won't get funding if you say you made a mistake. The farmers, actually, we have to see their need first. Because in uh, a fluctuation in rain and all, uh, everywhere, uh, even in uh, Western Ghats, we are facing a lot of problem with that. That's why our product like uh, storage of water will uh, go. And the selection of seeds, uh, also an important uh, thing in um, how to, uh, that's an adoption method of uh, climate change and all. And even in uh, the uh, wildlife, uh, conflict will, uh, is going up. So that community radio service uh, somewhere in a very remote village in, uh, uh, in our area, uh, mobile uh, won't work. At community radio, uh, we can adapt to uh, inform them what is uh, what will be happening and uh, that the group of elephant is coming uh, this direction. All these things we can uh, say uh, in terms of uh, the condition of weather will affect on the conflict. It, it arise the we observe that arise the uh, uh, this one uh, the conflict between uh, wildlife and uh, human and all. Uh, so, even in uh, agriculture also, the, uh, we can see that the seed bed is uh, losing, like uh, number of uh, 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 seeds, uh, seed bed we can test in um, soil. So, organic, uh, uh, this one, uh, content is going down because of uh, climate change issues and uh, number of uh, species, uh, shrub and herb species are uh, disappearing. Uh, so all these things we have to uh, uh, with having in the mind and uh, uh, initial stage while selecting the crop and selecting the seed we have to start with that. I just had one last point which is very, you know, the point about, uh, I'd like to just continue this issue. From what I can hear, there's, a, there's an issue and for risk taking. And I think the risks are on scaling what is showing up in all the discussion are quite a bit, especially if you go to different places. So in terms of financing those, uh, as, you, as you go to different, uh, one is the cost-benefit analysis definitely isn't done. But that apart, I think even if you had to do it, I think you would still discover that you would have to invest a lot. I think that, that is fine on paper, but ultimately what comes out is the fact that either you don't do it because your costs are high, or you, if you do it, then you... You do need, if you go to a completely different place, a very large country. And I think uh, that's one, one thing is somebody is going to have to, have to finance that, that risk of doing it. And I think what we don't have as prototypes are those financing models. That is, in other words, which part of it is called startup? Who will finance it? Who will take it to the next level? So this doesn't come to an organization as a package. And I, in my belief, I think part of the reason we fail is because we are all coming at it at different points and there's a huge gap between your startup and your scaling. By then, other things have gone wrong. So you haven't had a chance to move this. So there isn't a package of donors to start up and then you have ventures, social venture, and then you have bigger capital enterprise finance.